Hello, my name is Romaline Ante, and I'm going to read from my poetry collection, Anti-Emetic for Homesickness. The Making of a Smuggler Wherever we travel, we carry the whole country with us. Our rice terraces are folded garments. We have pillars of trees, a rainforest on a hairbrush. We dig alimasa crabs out of sand and use them as tabs to zip our bags. We immigrants are experts in packing. It's in our genes. If the border officer stops us, let him dive into our belongings, like a man trying to fish in an ocean ruled by sharp corals, stinging anemones. Let the smell of old socks roll up like bats. He can squeeze the yellow packet harder and not know it is pig's blood. He won't hear the squeal as he chucks it aside. He wasn't there, mud-soaked in a pen, chasing after the erratic swine. The officer might ask, no sauce, no chicken feet, with a broken accent, as if it would be easier for us to understand, but he can't smell my hands, see the sediments under my nails, fermented fish and all we did in it. He can't cup his ear with my palm and hear the surfs of Shargal Beach. He can't follow me through the gate, even with his gaze. He'll miss the gleam of a red quill in my lug sole, as when he didn't hear my uncle's knife grind back and forth on a wet stone, or how he slit the neck of my rooster to teach me about survival. The officer did not feel the pot of hot water getting lighter when I poured it over the carcass. He wasn't there at that moment where I rip out the feathers I once used to caress. Mastering English In the UK, when they say the sky is not working, they mean God is too high to hear your prayers. The television channel The phrase, a drop in the ocean, indicates very little amount in comparison to what is expected or needed. All the migrants who mysteriously vanished at sea. An arm and a leg is the constellation Marara, deity of rain clouds, seen from the porch where your colleague housemate used to sit with her younger brother. What she says as she turns off her heater. What does I'm just popping out mean? A man rattling a bolted door, adamant to fetch his daughter from school, even if his daughter has already had daughters of her own. Your lie when you left your child to work in another country. If the charge nurse declares it's neither here nor there, you must understand it as something unimportant or irrelevant, an opportunity to ask, where is it then? Invisible women. You see them everywhere, these invisible women. One navigates the ache of a corridor and the hour glints with a salvo of needles. A steel intubating stylet enters a mouth like a forced prayer. On the news, an invisible woman fell asleep on the steering wheel and somersaulted into daybreak, debris glittering across the motorway. A splinter buries deeper. She speaks to her patient about his petunias, but doesn't mention the blooms of tumors on his endoscopy scan. They are everywhere, though some hazier than others. Flick through their passports to find only a page, their names and countries erased by sun rays. These invisible women, goddesses of caring and tending, but no one hears when their skulls pound like coconut shells about to crack. My mother walks to work when the sky is black and comes out from work 
when the sky is black. Her footsteps leave a snowdrop-studded path. In the middle of a plaza, she poses, the downpour tricking her eyes to believe the statue in the square is a fellow invisible woman. Once, my mother cut through the blurred backs of men towards a gasping child and found a blade of grass fluttering in his throat. The air opened and she was gone. And the last poem that I'm going to read is a poem that I've recently read um, and I really like it and I think it's it's such a nice poem to end my reading today. This poem is written by Luisa A. Gloria and it's called Here. Here. In the ticking drone and home ablaze in the trees, in the wet and dark blue provinces crossed by long-legged birds, in the tender aglow of disappearing afternoons, sometimes I catch hold of those parts of a life we didn't lose, after all. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joy Kapida. I am a senior library assistant at Northcote Library for Wandsworth Libraries. And we are here right now with a fantastic Romalin Ante, who has just shared with us some of her work. Romalin, how are you today? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you, Troy. Long time to <laughs> see. How are yes. you? <laughs> I'm great. Thank you. It's great to, to have you in this interview and to actually have time to actually talk again. <laughs> it's been a while. Thank you. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Yes. And thank you for, um, yeah, coming over to talk about your work. Um, first of all, congratulations on your debut collection, which came out with Chato, uh, Anti-Emetic for Homesickness. How are you doing about that right now? Uh, thank you. I mean, it's it's really overwhelming to see the responses, especially of readers. I mean, it came out last year, so I I have this feeling that it's been quite, even though it's just last year, it's been quite like a long time since it's it's come out. But I'm I'm overwhelmed um, by the readers' reactions, especially readers from other backgrounds, um, like non-literary backgrounds specifically. So I get readers from the nursing background, healthcare system background, uh, from the migrant backgrounds. Those are the comments and the responses that really matter to me at this mm. point in my life, I think. So it's, it's, it's really great. Yeah, it's, um, I remember first reading the book and um, as a fellow Filipino person and a Filipino poet, I think it's fantastic that you have created this collection of work that provides space for this identity, you know, Filipino nurses, which takes up a lot of space, a lot of amazing um, work at the NHS and in other forms of healthcare. And I think, you know, as I'm not in the healthcare system, I don't work there, but I am a Filipino person. So that means I have some dis I have some connection with them, like a lot of my titos and my titas and my family, they all work in the NHS. And I think even though I live with them and I hear their stories every day, to hear to hear your stories and to hear everyone else's stories through this craft of poetry, um, is beautiful. And um, I thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yes, I mean, when I first wrote it, I didn't really think of it as, oh, I'll be speaking for Filipino nurses or migrant nurses. I was just mainly speaking from my own perspectives and my family's perspective. My family, um, oh, I came from a clan of nurses. My mother is a nurse. My sister Ilmo and my sister are all nurses as well. So I think it's quite, it's quite, it was quite important for me to create that narrative because I've never really found any migrant nurse, especially Filipino nurse narrative in the literary landscape. And I feel that it's important, especially Filipino nurses comprise the largest um, proportion of migrant nurses in the UK. It used to be second to Indians, but now Filipino nurses are actually the highest proportion of migrant nurses in the UK and little are known about us. So I, I thought, you know, a work like this is, is necessary. Mm, I think so too. And um. It's interesting because um, 
that kind of leads to my first question, actually. So ever since the book has released, um, I just want to know like how your relationship with your work has developed or progressed with sort of the, the responses and the, the experiences of having this book out and from the people who have read it. I just want to know about that. My relationship with my work as an artist or as a nurse? And as a nurse, yeah. And as a nurse. <clears throat> um, I didn't, you know, at, at work, I, I don't really <laughs> proclaim that I am a poet. <laughs> It would have been it would have been easier because I would have had more support, I guess. But I don't really say, oh, I'm a poet. I've published this book, although they eventually found out about it um, because I I, I had spoken to like a couple of colleagues and um, and then the words kind of like spread like a wildfire. It's. I am extremely lucky, I think, to be in this kind of narrative to be a nurse, a Filipino nurse in the UK. Um, I think that it really gave me quite a lot of ideas about um, about how I can tackle my artistic work. Mm -hmm. Even though I didn't really study, well, I didn't, I didn't have any formal qualifications as a writer. I feel that my nursing background or my nursing career has taught me how to become a writer. It taught me to pay attention to the world and to what's inside me. And that's what I brought to my writing. With regards to, to the writing wor world, um, yeah, I, I feel lucky because I feel that if I just got the right time that, you know, the, especially during last year, the pandemic, um, people like to know the story of Filipino nurses and that's why I, I said a while ago that I'm really lucky to, to develop or to gather new readers, especially readers from other backgrounds, because those are the people that really matter to me. I realized that at first I thought, oh, I wanted to impress the poets because I'm, you know, I'm trying to be a poet. I don't want to be seen as just a lousy writer. But at the end of the day, I realized that actually it's not about that. It's about what I'm trying to bring out with my work which is really my first my the very first reason why I'm writing it's about why I'm writing and who am I writing for why am I writing this um yeah so even though there's a sense of I mean I've received a lot of emails and messages thanking me and saying how how the book really inspired them for example the most recent one I received um, an email from someone in Africa who read the book and they were talking to me about how they also have the idea of balik bayan boxes, which is one of the poems in the book, notes inside the balik bayan box. It's a box where, as you know, we send, um, we fill it with gifts and send it to the Philippines, um, to our families back home. And they were talking about, they also have like something like a balik bayan box. They use a barrel and they put gifts inside that barrel and send it and send it back home. Um, um, so this person who had experience being an immigrant in the UK, well, they live in Africa now, but he really connected with that kind of immigrant experience. And I think that's that's a real treasure for me because as an artist, it is an acknowledgement that actually my work is inspiring other people, or at least it is speaking with other people um, to the very least. And I think that's that's what it it's all about. I hope I answered your question. I kind of forgot. No, no, yeah. You answered it fantastically. I think there's such beauty in what you said. And I think from what I'm hearing you're saying is there's so there's such power to um owning your personal perspective and your lived experiences and actually knowing yeah. how to use them both in terms of craft and with such respect and using them as tools to better your own writing and your own art. I think once you learn how to balance that relationship, there's magic. And I think magic is one of the many ways I, I would describe your writing, I think, because you are so unashamedly yourself and you are, you know, as, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, you keep, you know, and I think, again, this is the space that you're creating both for yourself and for the people who resonate with you. And the fact that someone from a different culture and different background said that, hey, look, your poem about your own lived experiences, the one you probably wrote, 
with the intention of just expressing your own stories, it actually resonates with someone else. And that's, mm. that connection is so beautiful, I think, as, a, mm. as, a, as an artist. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, well, I took that as a compliment <laughs> for <laughs> what you said. I mean, I mean, this book is really heavily influenced. Not heavily, I wouldn't say heavily, but, it's great, but, 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 but influenced by my own experiences. But also at, at, at one point, at different stages, I also kind of like have to imagine things. Like, for example, in one of the poems um Lansonis I think it's it's Lansonis um I'm doubting my own poem <laughs> um in one of the poems in the book um Lansonis which is about how distance and migration affect a romantic relationship you know I left the Philippines when I was 16 I never had any romantic relationship with anyone in the past so I do I couldn't really relate to that <laughs> um I don't know the feeling of leaving a romantic person behind so at that point, I was, you know, I had to use my imaginative energy as, as what poets do. Um, but I think also what you were saying about how the magic comes out because the experiences is real. Therefore, the emotions are real as well. Um, I think I, I think I really resonated with that. Um, to begin with, I was writing just for the sake of, you know, spilling out my guts as a teenager. <laughs> um, however, I really believe that poetry as well, we don't write to just express, you know, or to, to narrate our own tales. I think writing for me has been a method that transformed me. And I guess what I'm trying to say is through my writing, it, trans it transformed me, but also it's nice to hear when other people say to you, oh, they've been transformed by it too. You know, they, they were able to also do a little bit of self-reflection about themselves or about how they relate to others, to other, other culture. Uh, that's, that's the magic in it for me. Um, how does the art transform you? Mm. yeah I think that reminds me of sort of something that I experience a lot is whenever I read poems that I've written that I find to be the most embarrassing to be the most open to be the most like the one that exposes me the most that's the one that people gravitate to the most mm. and that's the one that people keep asking about it's like I don't I mean that's so embarrassing but I guess if you like it I guess you like it <laughs> yeah, so that <laughs> yes. reminds me a lot of what you said and um once you allow yourself to just write and to just connect yourself with the writing without thinking too much about the craft or mm. the technicalities of it all, once you, it's all, a, it's all a heart thing, isn't it? Once you let your heart do mm. the work, everything happens. Yeah, you have to show kind of like, you have to be vulnerable in your own state of mind first. Because, mm. mm. I mean, I work now as an editor of Ambit Poetry. Uh, I do it with Costa Chalakis, but also... I co-edit Harana Poetry with him. And sometimes it's so hard when you're writing and then your editor's kind of like, editor's hat is on there as well. Sometimes you just you just have to allow yourself to be vulnerable and whatever, just, just mm. go with the flow. Yeah. Obviously editing would come much, much later. But yeah, yeah I, I, could, I could relate to that. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that because actually leading up to my next question about you being... Um, an editor for Harana and Ambit just if you want to share us with us your experiences of because we've been talking so much about writing from a, an artist perspective of using it as an expression and using it for you know an external thing how how does being an editor how does being on the other side of that spectrum feel mm. like for you and I and how does that inform your work I guess um, with regards to antiemetic for homesickness, it really didn't inform my work much <laughs> because when I was <laughs> when I was writing it, I wasn't you know I wasn't really editing any magazines yet. I mean, Har Harana, I think we started it back in 2019, so that's the last year when I was writing antiemetic. So my poems in antiemetic are very raw. Thankfully, I have a very um, helpful editor. She's very tough, but. <laughs> but I think she she's she she's what I needed at that time um, to really look into the process of editing. I'm always careful on the word 
editing. I don't really like the word editing. Um, a mentor of mine, Marjorie Ivasco, she she told me once that next time you're telling yourself, oh, I'm going to edit this poem or I'm going to like do some editing work, just change the word editing to crafting. So you're actually acknowledging and claiming that you're an artist, that you are crafting this work. This work. So how, for example, Filipino artisans craft their own material, you know, whatever it is, whether it's a pottery or a textile, when, when you kind of like, convince yourself that yeah I'm crafting this you're mm-hmm. working towards that sense of um, perfecting your craft or your work whilst knowing that actually it's not going to be perfect mm-hmm. so I think that's what editing gives to me nowadays uh, so maybe not so much for anti emetic for homesickness but with my new work that's what I'm uh, I'm finding myself that I'm doing so I'm like every time I'm editing I know that I'm working towards that um, that goal of how I can move this forward, or how mm. I can um, how can I move this poem poem forward, or how I can um, how I can reach that kind of like next level with this poem. With regard to editing of magazines, um, that that experience as a whole are you know it's really helpful to me. I mean, I get to read a lot of people with different styles, uh, different techniques. And I think for me, it's, it's precious because it's my own, um, it's my own time to study poetry as well, to self-learn it more or to question, to ask questions um, specifically. I think it's, it's such a beautiful way of, I guess, redefining what it means to work on a poem, right? To use crafting, so beautiful. Um, because it becomes less of a clinical activity. It becomes more of a, there's more sensuality to it. It becomes more tactile, right? The poem is not just a collection of words put together. It's, it can be seen as like an actual, like ma- machinery almost, or like a yes. woodwork. And this is something very helpful about that. Yes, yeah. I guess. Yeah, definitely. I mean, not I guess, but definitely. Um, Because when we're, when we say editing, it's so like, <laughs> editing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you were I guess with editing with me how it well how it is with me is that I'm always looking at what can I take out or what's not working whereas with crafting it's not just that that I'm looking at I'm I'm looking at how to not only push my poem forward but also to honor what what I'm trying to say with this poem how can I really bring that out out that kind of honoring like what you said and that yeah. kind of like tactile thing yeah that's amazing um i guess my next question is um it's kind of out of off tangent a little bit but i guess you know i think personally i think it's a I, i'm really enjoying hearing you speak about you know being a filipino poet and being an asian creative in a in a uk setting i guess This is more of a personal question I have for you, but in terms of any advice you could give any any Asian writers out there living in our country right now, if any, I guess, sense of um, little tidbits of wisdom that you can give us. Um, oh my God, <laughs> not very wise. <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, it really, it's, it's a nice question, um, it's, but it's quite hard because Who am I advising? Am I am I advising someone who's already in the kind of like business, or am I advising someone who's um, just starting? But what I find the most helpful advice um, that I often give myself as well is that it's okay to look at others' work, you know, to to study other people, and to it's okay to 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 follow other artists especially if you admire them and one of your aspirations is to be like them or at least work like them. Um, but at the same time, you, you really have to focus on your own journey and you really have to focus on your own path. Um, especially nowadays, I've got quite a lot of friends who 
are asking me, oh, you know, I feel really sad or I feel really downhearted because I feel like I'm working so hard and then I don't really get any recognition. Only this person is getting the recognition. And at one point, at one point, I felt that as well, um, especially after my book was published. I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> it's so hard. Um, <clears throat> but I think the most important thing is focus on your craft because it is your craft no other people can can you, you cannot work like them because they're not you and also they cannot work like you no one will ever 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 be, be able to give you the best advice but yourself although saying that when i say be best advice it doesn't mean that you you shouldn't ask or seek advice you know as much as possible go out there join some workshop groups or seek a mentor um I've been really lucky because I have, I've got three, um, three really good mentors when I was working with anti emetic for homesickness. But at the end of the day, you have to kind of ask yourself and ask yourself, what is, what is your book um, asking you? What, what does it need? Or let's not say a book. What is the poem asking you? What does it need? So it's at the end of the day, it's just going to be between the two of you, you and your work. So focus on that. Mm. I think that's the that, that that's one of the advices. I think that's a, an amazing advice because it reminds you, you know, that it's okay to just to not care about the others, the other things around you. And it's okay <laughs> to, to focus on yourself because a lot of times I guess people feel the pressure of like, oh my God, now now I have to worry about someone else. I have to care about someone else. Like, oh no. But then again, to hear you say, like, it's okay to not do that. It's okay to just yeah. focus. Yeah. I think that's so much power. Especially in with um, East Asian or any, I think any poet of color, uh, you'll hear you'll hear some comments like, oh my God, I gotta work, I'll gotta write like this, because there's another poet of color who's writing about this or writing about that. I gotta write like I'm this intelligent <laughs> woman, or like I'm gonna write about my exotic place. At the end of the day, it's about you and, and the poem. At one point, at one point, I experienced that. Like, you know, people telling me, oh, all you can write is about nursing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, so what? I, I wanted to write about nursing. <laughs> exactly. I didn't think that, of course. But I was thinking, even if they say to you, write about this, or even if they mock you, all you can do is this. If that's really, really in your heart, you think that that's what you want to do. And that's what you want to show and bring out to the world. Then what's wrong with that? Mm. I think I think, I think truth, it's so hard yeah. that you know, especially young writers. It's not nice to pressure pressurize them with um, t telling them almost or giving them kind of like direction of where to go or like what to write or you know in order for you to be in this kind of like <laughs> world. Yeah. yeah. I think I think um, a sense of truth is the most important thing, and I think once you keep on to that, and once you understand that you yeah. can hold on to that, and that there's power in holding on to that, that's all that matters. You know, all the outside voices. It's okay that they don't matter to you. I think that's yeah. I think that's what I hear from you. I think that's beautifully said, and I can keep on listening to you all day if I could, <laughs> talking about this. Um, but I do have one last question for you. And it's kind of related to what we've been talking about just now. Um, and I love this question. Um, if you could speak to your past self from five years ago, what sort of advice would you give them with all that you know now? Just in general. Um, um, I would just say to be kind, really. At the end of the day, whether I'm talking about the nursing field or the poetry field, let's talk about the poetry field first. It's, you know, the field is so small. And also so big at the same time, you know, we, we will all meet each other at one point or another. And at one point or another, you know, you might, you may be here now, but at one point you'll be there. <laughs> and vice versa, you know, whoever is in front of you might be there. At the end of the day, you just have to be kind to each other, you know, be, have really good allies in, in whatever field you are. You don't need to be in a certain clique or to be in a big group just people you can trust, you know, you can share your work to, you can share ideas with. Um, and 
always, I think always stay, like keep your feet on the ground mm. and, and be humble. It's, it's, it's difficult to do, especially if you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as well as a nurse, you know, when you're, when you know that, oh, you've got so many years of clinical practice and you're thinking, oh my God, you <laughs> Yeah. Well, how could you do that? Yeah. <laughs> That's not the highest quality of care. <laughs> so I, at the end of the day, someone will always be, uh, will, someone will come who's always be kind of like a novice, more novice than you. But it doesn't mean that you should, you, and I'm speaking as well at Poetry Wives. doesn't mean that you know that you know everything, you know, that you, you have the right to to talk down to them. Just be kind to them because one moment they're novice and then the next they're like judging <laughs> something else yeah and, and friendship friendship is really is, 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 is a very important thing friendship real real friendship and always um honor you said one advice but it's kind of like it's you know, long advice with, a, with so many commas <laughs> it's great i and love honor it the people who were there before you mm, that's beautiful it's a beautiful way to end it yeah, because you're not you're not the first person in in this field. You know, there's people behind you, and there's people who supported you and who did the work to help you. And you can, yeah, I think that's great. I think friendship and honor, friendship also is a big deal. Mm. Um, yeah, and I'm glad to say that we're friends. Yeah, we're friends, <laughs> yeah. and we support one another, and that's fantastic. And I think that's yeah. a solid foundation, and uh, it make, it just makes the whole thing so much easier, and so much more pleasant, and so much um. Yeah. so much more fun i think yeah yeah definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah romelin thank you so much for coming over to talk to us it's been a pleasure hearing your wisdom and your experiences um, thank you so much troy yeah. it's so nice talking with you and i hope yes. we see each other in person um one of these days soon enough soon enough thank you for having us and thank you for coming over if anyone is interested at all in buying romelin's book it's currently out right now it's called anti-emetic homesickness it's available now in all leading niche uh bookstores right and online as well yeah yeah thank they you just... so much thanks thank you thank you <laughs> oh, 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 yeah i hope so <laughs> <laughs> they are they are they are yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. thank you so much troy <laughs> have a good one thank you so much thank you bye <laughs>